Greetings, listeners. Pardon this brief interruption uh, before we get to our episode concerning Nicholas Rorick and the Stone of Destiny. Uh, this message is to bring attention to our Patreon account, which is patreon.com slash consensus unreality, uh, where for only $5 a month, you'll get bonus episodes, written content, discussion threads, um, a recent bibliography of books referenced in the past two seasons, and much more weird stuff. Um, It is also where this episode originated, uh, which we are now unlocking for our free uploads. Um, And a big thank you to our patrons, present and past, for all your support. Uh, Enjoy the episode. Shut up. <laughs> Today we're talking about Nick Rorick. <laughs> Nicholas, Nicholas, Nicholas. Nicholas Rorick, uh, the Russian diplomat, hmm? painter, ah, and uh, sort of key figure in early 20th century so cultism much. Oh my worldwide. God. He's a really crazy figure, actually. Um Man, what a what a wild story. Uh I think I became aware of him actually through the documentary that we're going to talk a lot about. Um we probably mentioned on the show before. Um but I actually visited the Rorick Museum um many times in New York. I totally recommend it. It's an amazing museum. His paintings are really incredible, and there's also some great yeah. artifacts in there. Um, they have all the books um, that he wrote and that his wife, Helena Rorick, wrote. Um, his wife was uh, one of the earliest translators of Blavatsky. Um, oh, yeah. She was big into theosophy. I think, actually, his wife, Helena got him involved in the theosophical society yeah Um, what is it with helena's and theosophy huh don't know couldn't tell you but there's something there um yeah so yeah the paintings really are like pretty astounding they're if if you've ever seen them uh any listener out there yeah, they're like I don't even know. They're just beautiful. They're beautiful. It's totally worth a visit. Um it's a free museum on what is that? The upper east side by like Let's just say it's in the Seinfeld area. Yeah, River, Riverside Drive <laughs> um area. It's it's really like two blocks from the Seinfeld Diner, which is hilarious. <laughs> uh yeah. <laughs> I had a, I had a good. Uh, well, anyway, the, the <laughs> I, that would have been a sick Seinfeld the, episode for sure. The Chintamani Stone, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Kramer. Uh, well, I was just down by the Rorick Museum, Jerry, and they got they have the they got the Chintamani Stone there, and the <laughs> and the keystone on the wall. They got the Chintamani Stone, Jerry. That's uh, so that's that's the Kramer uh, <laughs> Kramer talking about. What well, what is the Chintamani? Oh, stone? Jerry, they got a Chintamani. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good George. Uh, That's a a chin chin to <laughs> and then yeah. That's, Jerry's actually a harder impression to do. He'd be like, What? Yeah. They've got the Chintamani stone? Yeah. They've got stones. They got stones in the building. Has it got a cornerstone in the stone? Stone of destiny in there. So what is, What's with what all that? these stones? <laughs> I say it's the pillow stone, Jerry. That's what they say. What does that mean? This documentary uh, about this uh, this rock. God damn it! I'm being stalked by one of those bugs with like a million legs right now. Oh wow! That's because you're talking about. Uh, We're not talking about fucking uh, H.P. Lovecraft shit tonight. So I don't know why this guy's here. <laughs> it's not your night. It's not your night. Go back in the hole. <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah, well, this stone we're rambling about is one of the more fascinating aspects of Rorick's story that I think we'll get into. Um, if you don't know who this guy is, um, he was, like Ben mentioned, a prominent figure um, 
pre-World War One in Russia and then especially in Asia um, and also in like Latvia and stuff. Um, yeah, he was all over. He's kind of... It's like kind of no one to compare him to today. Certainly not. He had his hand in two United States presidencies. Was uh, well, not presidencies, but presidential campaigns. Yeah, I thought you were gonna say president. So I was like, damn, damn, right. Nick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he. Um, yeah. He Wait. What? What? Uh, was that? Uh, who were the presidents? Wilson or Roosevelt? Uh, well, I guess Roosevelt. And then Wallace, he was actually like oh, right. Wallace's yes. like guru. Yeah. And Wallace funded his um, mission. His uh, Manchurian expedition was funded by the United States Department of Agriculture in 1934 right. and 1935, which is kind of like an insane expedition. Um, yeah. It says here they they found 300 species of xerophytes, collected herbs. Conducted Man. archaeological studies. Um, that one is pretty wild. Uh, the one yeah. I've been reading more about is actually the Shambhala project, which is his expedition through uh, right. Asia and the Himalayas, and that is like really fucking crazy. Like, yeah, it's like trying to find. I mean, Shambhala is like more or less what Twyman would have called like a hyperspace kingdom, right? Yeah, but I, I mean. Was he looking for, like, the real, like, the town? No, he was certainly, like, working some espionage stuff at the same, like... That's true, right, yeah, yeah. He gets, I think people peg him, um, or want to, like, peg him one way or the other, where they want to see the artist mystic, or yeah, yeah. some people want to just say, like, oh my god, this guy was, like, a double agent, essentially, like... Right. And there's a ton of that in there, um... He but was I, everything. Yeah, I think he comes from that insane time, though, at the birth of modernism when, you know, your uh, conviction for spirituality really was, like, so intertwined with your political right. proclivities and stuff and activities that yeah, it kind of just is, is one and the same. I mean, you see the same kind of stuff with, like, theosophy happening in right. other places, too, you know, like, where the the mythology almost is made manifest through like political activity. Right. Yeah. So That's so the kind of thing that like, like Mitch Horowitz covers a lot in his, uh, in his works talking about that, like the connection between politics and yeah, and it happened like, here. Gary too. Lock, Gary Lockman too. Yeah. That's such a, it's crazy how intertwined like esoteric movements were with different political movements. So I guess they kind of still are. Yeah. So, yeah. um, let's see. When was Rorik born? To give a little background here. Yeah. Um, What's his sign? He was born in 1874. He died in 1947. I think the first... He, he basically, like, studied painting at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first um, times he comes to prominence is he makes the sets for Stravinsky's Rites of Spring. Um, right. Are you familiar with that work? Me? Yeah. I love it. Can't get enough right of, right of the goddamn spring. <laughs> uh, no, I, I am familiar, though. And, yeah, I was just looking at... Uh, uh, Paul Weston did a lecture on this, and he, he did a little section about uh, about that whole... Uh, that whole setup and how it was kind of like a shamanistic kind of thing. Almost. Right. Yeah. If you read about like the, the public reception of like the yeah. touring, like, um, you know, it was, it wasn't quite an opera, I guess, but it was like, uh, I guess it was sort of like in that realm or whatever. But if you read like the, the public reception, the critical reception, it was like overwhelmingly positive. People were like in awe right. by some of the dancing and, and Rorick's, set designs um were received really well because they were like simple and kind of flat but very beautiful right um, it almost reminds me of kind of like symbolism or you know like symbolist stuff or like uh like early abstract expressionism almost right 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 but, or whatever they called that in russia it had its own kind of little movement um oh uh, like well i guess there was like malevich and 
Right. What is that stuff called? It's like. But they're almost constructivism. They're, they're so, yeah. Maybe, but it's like so landscapey too. Um, he was born on October 9th, making him a Libra. Right. For for our astrology listeners. Yeah. So he gets interested in theosophy pretty early on from his soon-to-be wife Helena, um, and he comes to prominence like pretty young in theosophy, and I think like he's first kind of exposed to the Bolshevik stuff actually through like his sons when they're kind of like going huh. into like their schooling and like their early or the their late teen years and stuff and he like has a strong rejection to it because yeah. he is kind of like coming from that place of embracing like uh Russian cultural traditions you know of like very like trying to like re-engage these very old cultural traditions and stuff and it's almost a sort of like classicism right yeah so he was not uh not a comrade huh not early on but he does yeah. like <laughs> it, it seems like there was a shift and that's really interesting because there's this character who meets him at some point and uh he is actually like we now know that he was definitely like a a bolshevik like um Pre KGB, <laughs> yeah. and this guy gets really. I, I have to find his name, but he gets really close to um, Rorik and kind of starts to like work him a little bit. Huh, yeah, yeah, and it seems that the expeditions in Asia had a lot of like kind of weird, maybe like trying to create like a communist Tibet. Like, mm -hmm. a, they were essentially trying to create, like, a Buddhist nation state under the bracket right. of communism. But it's also weird because he was, all of his artwork and stuff was confiscated in Russia. And he was trying to get, like, passage back to Russia and, and like, reclaim his artwork and stuff. And it seems he had met there. But, like, you, when you read about him, especially what I'm referencing a lot is the chapters on Rorik in this book, The Tournament of Shadows... The Great Game and the Race for Empire in Central Asia. Um, this book is pretty amazing. It's a pretty hefty book. It's like 600 pages. Um, but yeah, the chapters on Rourke, I think, is some of the most objective information on him you could find out there. Because Right, yeah. It seems like a lot of it comes from the museum itself, which is... For sure. Right, yeah. it's going to be good. <laughs> uh-huh. And it's weird, too, because I can remember, like, when I went to the Rourke Museum one time and I was speaking to the woman who worked there. She was, like, a Latvian woman, and uh, she was speaking about Rourke with a lot of, like, conviction and saying that, I guess, in the Latvian, like, marches for independence and stuff, um, they were, like, flying the Rorik Banner of Peace, huh. um, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh but yeah, the the information in Tournament of Shadows really gets into the minutia of uh, kind of like these weird relationships he was making politically, um, but he was also jumping around. And it's it's interesting, too, because in, in the book Altai Himalaya, which we were just talking about before we yeah. started recording, um, it, this is uh, Rorik's travel journal, um, and they have a map in there of their expedition through the Himalayas. But they edited the map so that it doesn't include, like, a detour to Russia. Yeah. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> so there's, like, right. clearly some sketchy stuff going on. Like, he, he denied that it was, like, a, a red mission, like, for Russia. Right. Um, but a lot, I think a lot of people suspected that, especially um, the, the most, like, paranoia surrounding Rorik actually came from Britain. Because <laughs> I guess they were still in control of India at the time. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and a lot of what he was doing was in India so he was being um, like watched heavily and followed by the uh, whatever what's the MI, MI6 and stuff I wonder if it was even MI6 at that point but right. he was being gang stalked <laughs> yeah um, yeah. Um, yeah that's really it's so interesting and I feel like this weirdly brings us back around to that whole little series we did on uh like the Nazi UFO connection and the hollow earth. Cause he was like sort of a, well, the whole Sh Shambhala thing is right in the middle of that. Yeah. 
it's re- it's really interesting and i mean he has so many writings um as does his wife and they're all super prophetic like they're mm. um like i said it comes from a place really where it's like speaking in this mystical symbolic language but it's also like kind of sword in hand you know like mm. really trying to like remake the world through like right. these movements yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel like that's something you see a lot that is like kind of forgotten about some of these like new age and proto new age thinkers is like that they kind of have that. I don't know if like it's violence, but like this sort of revolutionary thing, which yeah, it depends right. who it's coming from. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like I mean, even people like today, like what's her name, the person who ran for president. Oh, uh, Mary Marion Williamson. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, just, I feel like yeah. There's this kind of like, yeah, <laughs> like this weird political like idol, like self idolizing thing that comes out of a lot of these like icon thinkers. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's like some of the stuff that's chronicled in here too. Um, <laughs> is that when he went to uh, Tibet. I think the second time he was essentially received as being like a reincarnation of the Dalai Lama (laughs) and he like kind of went with it and stuff. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, no, I'm sure he like thought that of himself and to be honest with you, he like, he does some really impactful things politically. Um, yeah. And, and it's weird because his name isn't really like quite as well known as Blavatsky or Crowley or anybody like that. But Right. The implications of the things he did kind of have a more lasting effect politically, I believe, um, that we'll, you know, probably get more into. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> There's all the stuff about Maitreya, too, like the oh, yeah. theosophical kind of Christ figure. Right. And then like all the the ascended masters stuff, too. Yeah. And Which, I, I suppose... Yeah. It's interesting because they talk about how (laughs) the Bolsheviks had this whole campaign of, um, they recognized that theosophy was like this very powerful tool, um, especially Mm. because like, I think the, the princess of the, um, of the Royal family of Russia at that time was very interested in theosophy. So like (laughs) immediately Rorik kind of had her ear. And the Bolsheviks right. like saw the power of these movements like very early on, so they sent so, yeah. they sent in agents like, to like infiltrate like Masonic right. lodges and the theosophical lodges and stuff. It's yeah, it's it's not like a one to one relation, but I feel like it's it's almost as if like like theosophy was playing the role that like QAnon cultures do now, right? <laughs> because it's like so popular among like even the political class, and <laughs> it's right. like this like this like irrational seeming uh, force that like is, has to almost be like appeased. <laughs> I mean, it was really smart and it's really interesting. I think it also frames the world in a Western um, yeah. supremacist way, you know, like inherently. Sure. And I'm not yeah. saying that like theosophy is inherently bad, but I think that like that, um, is kind of the main direction of theosophy. And I think that's probably why it was so popular because it provided these answers, you know, to why, uh, imperialism and domination are like, okay, you know? Right. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was a lot of things, but yeah, I think you're right. One of the things it was, was like a self justification of like, yeah. Yeah. Strength of the will. But yeah, I mean, on the other hand, I'm endlessly fascinated by like the doctrines they put forth and stuff. And oh, like, sure, yeah, I don't think it's of, to be yeah. like discarded at all, right? Yeah, I just but think, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, there's no, there's no ignoring how. Uh, I mean, you can kind of like walk around it all day, but it had a pretty direct link into like uh, Ariosophy and like Nazi occultism. Yeah, so, so it's like yeah. <laughs> so check this out. So his um. The guy who basically, like, was proto-KGB, who got into his ear, he was Vladimir Shibiev. 
he um, was the export director for the whole expedition through India and stuff. Um, this expedition um, was funded with $300,000 by um, this fellow, uh, Horch, um, oh, who, yeah. who was like this rich um, <laughs> Wall Street guy. Right. And he is the one who builds the master building um for nicholas rorick as well which is still a skyscraper in new york um it's kind of an amazing building on riverside drive um it's actually the building that in ghostbusters is is like the beacon going up to like yeah (laughs) that's what it's based on is the master building um and it has a spooky vibe too supposedly inside like it had like a concert hall. It had studios for like artists and uh, yeah. you know researchers and stuff. Like I think Joseph Campbell had a residency there for a while, and like Manly P. Hall. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a pretty amazing space. Now it's just another one of the luxury apartment buildings there, which is kind of sad. Um, and there's a copy of a Rorick painting in the lobby. Um, but they actually copied it backwards, which is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, this fellow, this this Wall Street fellow, Horch, like, is just obsessed with Rorick um, and his teachings and stuff. He gives him three hundred thousand dollars. That's like a lot of money yeah. for nineteen. Uh, this is pre crash, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. This is like just before the stock market crash. I wonder what the equivalent of that is today. Um. Oh yeah, there's definitely like a calculator for that, but it's definitely in the oh, it's least, solid millions. Yeah, yeah, that's like ten million probably or something. Yeah. Um, ah, now I have to know. What well, what year was it? Uh, nineteen twenty three. Yeah, and he sets up a corporation for this expedition. This is where it starts to get really sketchy. Um. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, master building no, is it's four it's 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 almost five million. Five million? Okay. So not like a Yeah, just just about. That's still like a lot of money. It's not a totally yeah, like, so that's a lot of money. Unremarkable amount, but for some guy uh-huh. to just go like on some weird expedition, that's definitely like Yeah. I would uh, take it. For sure. <laughs> for sure. And the master building is kind of the focus of the mm. Lapis Exilis documentary, which we watched right. um, as a part of the research for this episode. Um, it's like a classic UFO TV core. <laughs> yeah, it, it rules. Um, it's one of the better ones. In yeah, that, that is a good one. In that nexus. It's not actually yeah. like a UFO TV doc. Like they definitely just slapped the label on it. Right, yeah. I mean, I think they do that with, like, half of their stuff or mm-hmm. more. Yeah. Even even if it has nothing to do with UFOs. <laughs> yeah. They still put that, like, UFO graphic at the beginning and shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, which is awesome. Right. Um, uh, this documentary, I think, is pretty tight. Um, it definitely rides the wave of, like, the post-Da uh, Vinci Code like um historical code breaker um you know like holy blood holy grail kind of thing um right. it's essentially a grail documentary um but it it's predicated on the idea that the grail is actually a stone um which i i suppose there is like historically mythological uh precedent for and it uh the main um folk the main person in the documentary is this dude Stephen Buff Perry is that right Yeah something like that definitely Buff is in the name <laughs> His name's something <laughs> Buff Perry it's I think yeah. it's like Stephen Buff Perry Or maybe it's Lewis or Louis Yeah Lewis Buff Perry that sounds right actually Yeah and he's like a cryptographer um it's really it's pretty fascinating though cuz it it's around it's um Begins with the Shepherd's Monument, which is right. um, the on the Anson Estate 
in Scotland. And, yeah. Um, and he was like a s- firmly associated with the Jacobite revolution. Um, and I guess it's said that the Jacobites had like this magical stone with them <laughs> during the, during the, uh, Re- Scottish revolution and stuff. Um, there's right. all these mas- <laughs> Masonic ties. Uh, and he's, I like it because it, I love the Nicholas Poussin painting, uh, the, um, the shepherds, you know? Yeah. 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 With the anagram, um, even in Arcadia, there's death. Yeah. But the way that Buff Perry is like decoding the painting, which is kind of a little bit analogous to the way it's decoded in Da Vinci code is that he's saying it's like the, um, one of the early Judaic families. Mm. Um, so yeah, he's tracing the pillow stone of Jacob. Yeah, what is um, just for? I mean, what is that supposed to be biblically? It's like Jacob fell asleep on it, and then like, well, or like, why is it significant? I guess just because it's a biblical artifact. I guess it like is supposed to have power. Like they say that right, these yeah. things have like like they emit like physical power and stuff. And they they get right. to that in the documentary where they're like there's some weird like nuclear con- connections and shit and like fucking yeah. Einstein um sends a letter of regard when they lay this cornerstone of the master right, yeah, building. That's really weird. In the same year that he produces the theory on general relativity. Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, they really kind of play that up, huh? Like yeah. it's this like major like generative like object which right who knows i mean it's it's interesting because the stone in question here the chintamani stone if you look this up it's like a stone of destiny uh kind of like the philosopher's stone or whatever right um there are several rorik paintings like at least five mm-hmm. or six that have this cask um and the right. cask apparently had the chintamani stone in it and the cask was certainly laid into the cornerstone of the master building in New York. Right, which is where uh, Kramer found out about it. Exactly. It's, 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 that's it's where the Chintamani Stone. It's the Chintamani Stone, Jerry. Um, it's actually, Kramer's kind of hard to do. Jerry, <laughs> it's the Chintamani Stone. I can't do it at all. <laughs> he's, like a, he's a good actor. Anyway, yeah, it's, um, so is that still there? I mean, the crazy thing is that the building manager after Horch, was it like Horch's son or something? He got murdered in the basement uh, because right. there was like, like the, I don't know if the documentary explained this up, but I guess the Jesuits like at one yeah. time possessed this stone. Um, they wanted it back. And there was a Jesuit like staying like in residency at the master building at the time. And the, the building manager was murdered in like the seventies in the basement, I guess. Cause apparently somebody was trying to break through to yeah. get to the cornerstone through like the boiler room. Cause the yeah. cornerstone is like, can be accessed through a wall in right. the boiler room. I mean, that's pretty interesting shit. It is. Yeah. That's like kind of where the legacy of Rorick as like espionage and, mystic kind of coincides again yeah right and like these the paintings um we'll definitely put some up on the instagram for this yeah uh or i guess it's just on the patreon um the paintings which depict the cask that is holding the stone are always like glowing and they're always like in these very prominent like mystical paintings one of which is like the stone horse, which is supposed to represent like the coming like Maitreya, like yeah. Lama Christ figure, you know, uh-huh. and and they will, and the cask will be like on its back, like radiating. Um, right. There's another one that I actually have on my wall over here, and it's like these four kind of like uh, robed figures like walking down into these caves. Um, and they're one of the one in front is holding the cask and it's like glowing. There's also a yeah. famous one of Rorik himself. It's a portrait that his son did and he's holding the cask. Mm. It's in one with Helena. Like it's in a bunch yeah. of paintings. Um, so they really like drum up 
the importance of this object. I um, love it. There's, I mean, there's a, I think I posted on the Instagram on a story or something that there's in one of Helena's books I have here, which is called on Eastern crossroads legends and prophecies of Asia. Um, there's a whole short poem she has, which is called, uh, the legend of the stone and the prophecies of Shambhala and Maitreya. Um, and in Rorik's poems too, in flame and chalice here and in other stuff, like he's talking about this stone, um, yeah. I don't, I mean, it could just be that like, they're smart enough to like create these sort of like power objects, you know, to like power symbols, you know? Right. But it's also interesting, like the precarious circumstances to which they would have, they would have apparently like gotten yeah. this object. And especially like in Helena Rourke's diary, she talks about being stalked and essentially like, uh, kind of hounded about this this object and stuff from all these different parties um and yeah it's like uh it feels like it's one of those like cursed like shrunken heads or something yeah it's like all this bad stuff starts happening to you like people getting murdered around it but it's like uh also telling albert einstein about relativity and stuff or whatever <laughs> right yeah. right um yeah, I wonder what it, I don't remember in the documentary. Are there are there images of it or like uh the Chantamani stone itself? Yeah, yeah. No. Or like uh illustrations of what it might look like. Um I guess one of the things is that the pillow stone of Jacob and there would have been another stone. Like I guess in in the biblical legends or whatever, there's two stones um that go together. And they're always associated with the Ark of the Covenant as well, which mm. is supposed to be this, like, you know, almost electric, like, generator yeah. object, like, you know. Yeah, the God is, his power or whatever is inside of it. Yeah. It's just another layer of of Rorik that's just so fascinating. Like, it, you could yeah. talk about just, like, this, the cornerstone of the Master Building, um... And the fact that this guy got killed in the boiler room because somebody was trying to crack through the wall and grab yeah. it. Like, and the master building itself, you know, has this mystique. Um, yeah. But then everything else involved in Rorik's life is so fucking fascinating, too. And he's so dodgy. Like, I don't think anybody <laughs> has been able to nail him down. Yeah. Um, he damn right ruined Wallace's presidential bid. Really? Yeah. yeah, they used letters that. Um, Wallace had written to Rorick and he I think in them he calls him my guru or something uh-huh. or my teacher yeah and uh, these letters got publicized in newspapers and Wallace was like a laughing stock afterwards oh no yeah yeah um, Rorick is certainly the reason why the eye in the pyramid is on the dollar bill he right. basically was the one who um made that suggestion through Wallace to FDR because yeah. Wa- was Wallace was like uh, FDR's vice president, right? I don't remember exactly, but related Secretary somehow. of State or something? Or? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's crazy. Do you think he was in the Illuminati? Rorick? <laughs> yeah. I don't really know. I mean, oh yeah, he was vice president. Right, Henry yeah. Wallace, yeah. Vice um, president. Yep. So he is he's the Man, this is such it's such a wild story. I mean, was Rourke in the Illuminati if anybody was? Certainly, yeah, right. Like him and Bob Dylan. Yeah. I'm um, just kidding. But yeah, I because at the end of that documentary, they go into all that Illuminati stuff, like, well, and like tracing it to the Cathars and um, what do they call like the parfait, like the the perfected ones, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like all that kind of. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny because it's like this critique of the Da Vinci Code that like then sort of turns into like its own Da Vinci Code. <laughs> yeah, I li- I mean I like that though. I like it better. Yeah, it's great. It does go hard though. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's also some funny shit in there, like when he's at the 
Rourke Museum talking to like the historian of the master building and he's yeah. showing her all these pictures and she's like, Oh my god, I can't believe it. <laughs> it's so fucking hilarious. Uh, <laughs> um God damn, I forgot I lost my thought now. Um Yeah, I mean was the Bavarian Illuminati like a real thing? I, I'm not even sure at this point. Like, yeah, I, I think for, probably. for so long, I, well, it, it certainly was like something. Yeah. And I think for so long, I believed that it wasn't like, it just kind of died on the vine, you know? Yeah. And now I think I'm coming back around to the fact that it like did like get tendrils into like things and, <laughs> There's a weird like I'm not going to I'm not trying to get you talking about Streber but I had a connection because I've been listening to um I've been listening to Supernatural uh by oh, yeah. Kripal, Kripal and, yeah and yeah. Whitley Streber yeah. trading writings um It's which, pretty it's a good book. It's great. That's, and and yeah. we're going to give it its day, don't worry buddy. Right. We're going to give but it its day on another episode. It's but, funny that that's the book that kind of sparked or not sparked, but maybe pushed him to publish uh, uh, Horsley to publish Prisoner of Infinity, or like it was kind of in conversation with that. I I know we got it. We'll, we're going to talk yeah, well, about. I guess we one. we're going to talk about. Re- you got to read Prisoner of Infinity. Yeah. We're going to talk about. It. We're going to get. To it on <laughs> maybe we should episode. do a yeah whole well, episode about that. Um, but there's what's a, the connection though. Well, like Streber is talking about one of the nights in which he has like a weird sexual encounter like sexual contact encounter and the it's it's predecessor is three knocks and Mm -hmm. um like a series of three knocks that becomes nine knocks and apparently the whole town like hears this phenomena um and i think it's actually creeple is talking about it and he's analyzing streber's like writings about this experience and he he makes the connection that in masonry, um, when a mason reaches the 33rd degree, they perform a series of um, three knocks three times. <laughs> and it's supposed Damn. to symbolize like this completion of like the complete spirit. And then Rorik has the flag, which is three circles, you know? Right. And I was, I was thinking like, this is such a weird symbolic connection. Like, Maybe not directly to, you know, Streber's weird experience, but to masonry, you know, like there's a yeah. direct lineage. Well, and Streber has the Gurdjieff connection too, which, right. and I feel like, uh, I feel like there must be, I mean, I know that there is at least some uh, connection between Gurdjieff and Rorik uh, traveling in the same circles. Certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, having sort of similar projects, except Gurdjieff was kind of like the, uh, you know, Bizarro Universe version of, of Rorik. What's interesting to me, though, is like for all of Rorik's efforts and these like expeditions were, ac- which actually are insane. Like, if you read about the expeditions, like he almost died like so many times. Like they got attacked <laughs> in towns and like berated, yeah. and it seems like they were like cornered animals a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, they almost died like a few times through like starvation and freezing to death and shit. Like these expeditions are actually, are actually insane. Um, yeah, and, I wouldn't do it. No, fuck no. And like the, uh, <laughs> the, um, political connections he makes are crazy too. He, he ends up actually like creating, um, the Rorik peace treaty or the Rorik act, um, which gets him nominated for the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Right. Um, and the Rorik <laughs> Treaty is essentially um, preserves like works of art in wartime. Yeah. Um, which is, I mean, gets him recognized on like a national stage. Uh, I feel like that was in the news back when ISIS was like destroying those things too. Do you remember probably. that? Probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. I remember seeing that mentioned. Which yeah. I was like, huh. I know that guy. <laughs> or, you know. Yeah. Nick Rorick. Um, yeah. What was his connection? So, was he ever like a full-blown theosophist himself? 
like uh, <laughs> um what? yeah yeah no he was like yeah he was prominent in theosophy early on i think right. it, it kind of became like the more eastern um influence side of theosophy but that's also a big right. part of it yeah yeah i didn't realize but there's an hp lovecraft story that refers numerous times to strange and disturbing asian paintings of nicholas rorick really in <laughs> at the mountains of madness dude i have oh, to yeah. read that one I, have, I guess I just, I probably read that before I'd heard of Rorick, so I, I didn't make the connection. I figured he probably just made a name up. That's yeah. awesome. Lovecraft cracks me up. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I have to read that. Yeah, that's really a great story. That was like, uh, yeah, big for high school, Ben. Um, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's interesting to me, though, that he, people claim that he had, Rorick did have these connections to the, the Bolsheviks. Um, because what they philosophically like were doing kind of goes against it seems like what what he was all about which was cultural preservation you know and like right preserving the history of of culture and yeah like and, a traditionalism kind of right which is like not which is what marxism is like all the opposite of yeah, it's not usually they're not usually in the same uh, in the same sentence unless they're being like contrasted. Mm. But there's always exceptions, um, so it's yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean. Wow, what a life! It's pretty amazing. Like, I don't know what. <laughs> you just, to, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I'm just like looking at the paintings again right now. And... Uh, yeah, I was doing that before. I, yeah, you kind of just like fall silent. They are really weird. Like, I love them. They're I really like yeah. them. I really like no, his, his style. I have um, that book of like it's called like Messenger of Light or something or Messenger of Beauty. Um, yeah, and it's just like really really nice reproductions of some of them. I like pull that out once in a while and just like damn <laughs> all right right it's true too i mean the, the kind of flat style of them is really interesting and he uses these yeah. gorgeous colors like his colors are just beautiful um, yeah. and i guess a lot of it was done like on these expeditions which is pretty insane too yeah um yeah i don't know i don't know what to make of them like i really am interested in him i love his works of art i don't think he was like malevolent but it does right. seem like there was some strong like attempts at you know political disruption especially in central asia and stuff in <laughs> tibet and whatnot like yeah and he was kind of like sort of like playing china against like other countries right. and stuff for sure he was playing the he was playing the game of thrones <laughs> right it was a tournament of shadows oh <laughs> uh, right yeah, yeah. I, I i don't know and i wonder how much that is just sort of like the the order of the day or whatever for anyone you yeah. know in, in positions of power back then versus how like how much like yeah he's like exceptionally like a power maneuverer but yeah, I don't know. Right. He's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm not sure that I'm like crazy about his poetry. Yeah, I've not really gotten into it yet <laughs> either. I think uh, you would have yeah. to like be in the frame of mind that like he's my guru <laughs> to enjoy right. these poems cuz they're all yeah. kind of like yeah. Real preachy like, you know. They're guru poems. They're the guru poems. <laughs> but I mean I I don't know. If you're close to New York, like definitely make the trip. I mean you could also you yeah. could make the trip there and then walk over to Central Park and you could see um an obelisk which was claimed from Egypt in the Damn. Uh probably from Teddy Roosevelt, um <laughs> doing all that wacky imperialism, but it's, it's right. Which is awful, but it's also kind of amazing to you could literally put your hand on an obelisk from like 
first century Egypt in Central Park. Yeah, yeah for just for no reason. You're just like, I want it. Yeah. <laughs> I want that. Well, maybe it was for some magical purposes that we don't understand. I'm sure someone's thought about that. Um, go to go over to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, there's yeah. a, an amazing paint painting by uh, Anselm Kiefer, who I was mm. hearing about. I was listening to um, the Black Sun book again recently. Oh yeah, and his renditions of Soul Niger, uh, yeah, or the Ingrata, the the black blacker than black, Dark Night of the Soul. Oh yeah, that book's great. I love that book. Yeah, um, we were gonna do an episode on that, but I guess maybe we just never got around to it. Maybe this time. Yeah, I mean it's it's tough to do. I feel like that's a tough one to do an episode just on it, but I feel like always mixing right. it in is really nice. Um, yeah, well, it's still like a larger, uh, like Jungian alchemical theme, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? So, what do you think about? Rorik here. What do, what what do you make? <laughs> what do you make of uh this this shady character, this guru fellow, this uh, very talented artist? Uh, right. I I he's an, an enigma, but certainly I, a historical enigma. I think if ever I just I think that, that that's just like the kind of person that comes around and like yeah creates these like little vortexes of influence. And that's just how history moves was with these either exceptional like weirdo people or like exceptional confluences of people. Can you imagine how persuasive he was? Yeah, I must have been, I guess. Like I'm listening to him talk right now. What is, is he speaking English? Yeah. He's got a pretty kind voice. I think he actually claimed like uh like Viking roots. I, I bet he did. Like Viking, yeah. Yeah. You can just people say that all the time. It's like, you know, I was a fucking Viking dude, yeah. so back off. Right, right. <laughs> um no, but I could yeah, I guess I could see that. What he do does you- have that. Look. What do you think about the Chintamani stone and the pillow stone stuff? You think there's <laughs> something to that, or do you think it's just like woo woo hooey creating like a fake right. power object? You know, just like a bunch of bullshit. Uh, <laughs> I think it's. I don't know. I really actually don't have any idea. Do I think it's like some kind of like exotic material that's like powering like something like or like gives? Yeah, I like maybe. Do I think it's the literal stone that Jacob or who you know laid his head on, or whatever that might metaphorically mean? Probably, probably no. I I kind of tend to think that those are more like metaphorically related isn't, objects. Isn't the kava like a space stone though? Yeah, I guess so. Like, or that's like I, an it, it, that's like a claim from like. Abraham, right? It's supposed right. to be like an Abrahamic like space stone. Yeah. I mean, the thing to me is like it's very easy to put yourself in the frame of mind where you're like, yeah, it's it's a bunch of bullshit. Like it's a fucking stone in a box. Like they're just creating like a a fake power object, which right. is which but is what symbols not, yeah. are, you know? Yeah. Like but right. at the same time like if that's true, why isn't the secret out? Like, why why do all these, like, very powerful people in the world care about these objects, you know? Yeah, for sure. Why are they right. seeking them? Like, why are these groups, like, seeking these objects? Like, I mean, I think it's something. Like, I just don't know where, like, myth ends and where, like, you know, historical reality begins. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm not sure, yeah, like, how it can be all of the things that people say it is or if it is you know, one, one or two of, like, you know, like, yeah, where it falls. I mean, I, I know this was a time in history when people were kind of taken by spiritualism and uh, all those movements and stuff, but I don't know. It reminds me of, like, you know, the stories about the, the Nine channeling group, um, which is something right. we're going to talk about in our whole series with Strieber. Um, it kind of reminds me of, like, Skinwalker Ranch, too. 
Yeah, 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 right. Like, if it's hooey, why is, like, all this money right. in, in being pumped into it? Like, certainly people are, like, showing you that they, like, powerful people are showing you that they care and that it means something. Right, um, it's crazy. I mean, I guess a lot of people will say that, like, well, first, you know, Skinwalker Ranch is, like, testing of non-lethal weapons or whatever. Chameleon, like, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that is like maybe it's plausible. Yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, like, I don't know. Is that the effects that these weapons have? Like make people have paranormal experiences? Like what's up with that? Right. Right. Like we, we made a gun that makes you see werewolves. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, dude, did you, did you read that thread I sent you about like Skinwalker Ranch and it yeah. just, it was a pretty good one. It kind yeah. of went into some wacky places, but right. they should go in wacky places, you know. It's a wacky thing, and then <laughs> that dude liked my my post. I sent you that, like. Uh, yeah, that trips me out. The the, own, the current owner of Skinwalker. I posted like a uh, something on my bookstore Instagram, like hashtag Skinwalker Ranch, because I was selling like uh, a patch. Oh, it was, like yeah, Skinwalker yeah. Ranch, Utah, on it. And the fucking yeah, Brandon Fugel, the Fugel. Like owner, the owner of this, and the employer of the consensus on reality favorite dragon. Uh, the I said no guard. digging. <laughs> we ain't doing no digging. Uh, that show's great. That was a great. Pa- if you guys didn't listen to that yeah. Patreon too, I think we called it Haunted Dude Ranch. Yeah, yeah. That one that is is one. sick. That was a great one, man. Because I think yeah. it was like. You, you were watching that shit maybe when you got your like vaccine or something and oh no I was like that was when I had those headaches so I was just like oh, fucking yeah. laid up laid out in bed with like this <laughs> deep despair and I was like all I can do is watch Skinwalker <laughs> <laughs> and I just like watched like that whole show in like a day <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, man awesome great time great times <laughs> um yeah. But yeah, I don't but know. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to know. I've walked past the corner. I've walked past the cornerstone of the master building many times. I've put my hand where the three Rorik, the symbol of Rorik is, the three um, circles and the banner of peace. I've been there. I've put my hand there. It's just, I don't know. It's fascinating. Like the the myth around it is is something really cool and i like that it's so accessible like it's it's right there hiding in it is on riverside drive and like nobody knows about it the museum's incredible too like definitely i wonder if uh i wonder if trump knows about it chintamani it's like it's chintamani stone and of course man he was he probably tried to buy the master building he's like (laughs) we're gonna want Two Trump Tower. They got the chink of Manny Stone. <laughs> Did you see the that like viral thing of George Bush posting the yeah. a picture of Trump Tower and everyone was like just gonna knock it down. It's cool. Bush knows. He knows people get a ride out of that. Bush <laughs> that's so fucked up. <laughs> if like if that's true that he's making a nine eleven joke and like he also is like in any way responsible for it he's like, hey. he just like <laughs> that's like really sociopathic <laughs> yeah I don't know uh, but yeah man I, I don't know I don't know what to make of this Rorick fellow anymore I got a bunch of his books here what was uh in that documentary they were kind of comparing him to like Nostradamus or something at one point like you see like someone that was making like Rasputin uh, Nostradamus like, like prophetic was he like trying to predict things like that? Was he writing like quatrains? Um, I think there's definitely like it's all prophetic writings, but it's kind right. of like trying to make manifest like through. Right. So not like prophecy and like a but prophetic in that it's like yeah, uh, yeah. yeah right. Like like William Blake. Right. Right. Sure. Right. 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 Not quite as um, good as Blake's writings though. No, Blake. Blake is a chef's kiss kind of dude. Mm-hmm. Um, we should do a Blake show one day. That stuff is. Cra- I feel like uh, I'm sure there've been books written about it, but Blake and Enochian, like the kind of crossover between 
Blake's mythology and like the John D. Edward Kelly stuff. Yeah, we got to do some some good stuff on Enochian because we haven't really dipped into that too hard. I I've been like for Patreon, we're gonna do this series on the alien other. Um, we're gonna talk about Streber trauma masking. Probably try and get myself a copy of Prisoner of Infinity. We're gonna talk oh, about yeah. the Nine. We're gonna talk about uh, David Hud- David H- Hutchins. Huggins. Huggins. Um, He's just a regular Jersey guy. Getting getting laid by the uh, visitors. Um, I met him. He was a very nice man. He's so a very nice we've man. We've got to tread, like, tread likely. <laughs> and there's, uh, you know, I think a, th- a thread that we're following still is the Kenneth Grant stuff as well. Um, we're going to be talking more and more about that yeah. as we find more time to sit down and read that stuff. Um, yeah, they just did a new paperback version of uh i think crowley and the hidden god maybe oh tight and so i'm gonna grab a copy of that or two maybe one for the shop Mm. and Mm -hmm. not that anyone will fucking buy it because people are fucking dumb send me a link Uh, to that um yeah uh, uh just kidding people would buy that but I find I think part of the reason why i wanted to do this new series for patreon and stuff is because of a line in uh, The Dark Lord by Lavenda in which he basically characterizes Grant's writings as like a warning of these um, intruders, you know? Like, I, I kind of didn't yeah. read it that way initially. Like, yeah. Because the way that Grant writes about it, it almost seems like he's like giving you a guidebook into the Mauve Zone, and I think that whole right. um, that whole Cincinnati Magic Journal group, um, like Conquering Child Press, um, from what I understand, I haven't gotten any of their stuff yet, but I want to get some of it. They're all they're, yeah. like a lot of their stuff is like incantations to conjure aspects of Mauve Zone and stuff. Yeah, it seems like. Oh yeah, if, if you believe the Lavenda angle, it seems like a bad idea, huh? Lavenda's telling you that Grant is giving you a fucking warning, like, yeah, wa- tread lightly, you know. <laughs> and I find that really interesting, and I want to try and parse that out for myself because you know Lavenda's a, a kind of weird character, but like, yeah, I don't get his deal. I guess he he recently like finished a trilogy of novels that are like within the Lovecraft mythos, but, like, incorporate, like, Grant-y kind of stuff, too. We should check those out sometime. Down. Dude, I'm definitely down. I yeah. kind of... I, I like Lavenda, even though he's, like, a bit checkered, like... Right. I'm yeah, yeah, me too. thoroughly enjoying that Dark Lord book, and I'm... I got Sinister Forces the Nine over there, and I'm waiting to... Oh, yeah. I'm waiting to jump into that one. Yeah, I love... Uh, what's that? Is that the, the first volume? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, I need to dive back into those. That's like almost like you can read like ten pages at a time. It's just like too fucking. There's too much in that in that series. It's like whoa. It's like uh, yeah, the closest there is to like a conspiracy theory of everything, kind of. Right. Except for, like, for, for yeah, yeah, an intelligible one, not like right. David yeah. Ike, every right. David Ike book, you know. Yeah, it's like, and it's you know American centric, obviously. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we could duck out here. I think we did a pretty good job covering Rorik. I mean, it's hard to get into the specifics because there's honestly so much. And I I mean, I don't think we'll ever know quite what to make of him. Um, But if you're interested in this guy, um, Tournament of Shadows is a book you could probably find online for pretty cheap. And... The rest of the history in that book is is insane too. Um, yeah. It's all kind of about the turmoil in, in Asia in like the 1920s, leading up to uh, the Second World War, I suppose. Like maybe it's between the first and second, or maybe it even yeah. covers like before the first, I guess. Hmm. Um, and then I mean, also like check out Rourke's paintings. Um, go to the museum if you're in New York. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they're open because <laughs> of the whole COVID thing. Probably. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a really interesting character. So yeah. I hope we did him a little bit of justice on this one. Uh, we've been thinking about doing this one for a while. 
Yeah. And Lapis Exilus is on YouTube. I kind of recommend it if you like that sort of historical yeah, um, cryptography stuff. Yeah. And it's kind of go- like the production's a little goofy too, which is sick. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I, I enjoyed it. It's like a. Yeah, it's like a it's a YouTube video more than like a documentary, but it's good. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. So I think we'll be all right back again soon. Um, hopefully with our first episode in our series about the alien other. Um. Yeehaw. It's going to be a weird one. Streber's yeah. really starting to give me the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Horsley yeah. angle might be apt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens. It's, it's, a, it's a weird world out there. In there, out there, right. wherever. Um, yeah. Yep, that'll do it for us. And thanks yeah. again for subscribing to our Patreon. Um, we'll be back soon. Okay. Ah, what's that? Not good. That's creepy. It's cool. Yeah, it's kind of cool. He's a smoking man. Ugh.